Hi folks, it's Mark here from the Australian DeFi Association, and we've got a special episode of the Getting to Know the Community podcast. We've got Steve Vallis on the show. Many of you will know him from Blockchain Australia. He was the former head there. He's now running something called Blockchain APAC. He's an advisor on a couple of different projects, including Scaffold Global, zero cap and more to come i am sure he definitely knows how to connect with folks he's an awesome and amazing collaborator and he is well traveled at the time of this recording we caught him just before heading over to the us to catch consensus and continue spreading the good word about blockchain as i mentioned collaboration is really key And it's something that we are firm believers of as well as community. And there's no greater community builder out there in Australia, at least in my mind, than what Steve has forged ahead with and what we are all trying to follow. So enjoy this episode, have a listen, learn something, reach out and connect, and I'll see you in the next podcast. Welcome back, folks. We're here with the awesome Steve Vallis, uh, former head of Blockchain Australia, and now doing amazing things with quite a few different areas. I'll get you to go into that, Steve, but uh, mainly Blockchain APAC and a few other advisory roles. But thanks for joining us, uh, uh, to agreeing to come to the uh, the community show. How are you today? Mate, I'm very well and grateful for the invitation. I said, you know, I show up to many of the things you do, Mark. So uh, when you ask, I know I must be there. We've got the photos to prove it uh, as well. And, you know, we've really appreciated whether it's been in Melbourne or Sydney or we've met up even on the Gold Coast at other people's conferences. So um, just for people that, you know, look, some may be very new to the space or just been living under a rock, and I'm sure there's very few. Um, but for people that don't know you, uh, you know, could you please tell us a, a little bit about yourself? How did you get into this space? What are you up to now? How long a version do you want, Mark? It can, it can extend for a long period of time. But uh, I know, the- I know, it's a dangerous question to ask. But let's let's go with a shorter one. Then we'll try to expand out. So, with the benefit of hindsight, it was the perfect path into this space. I had a few different things that I've done over the last decade or two. All of those sorts of things have lent themselves to uh, some value uh, being uh, ascribed to this uh, to this space that we're in. So, I. Uh, found myself doing a lot of work in digital strategy. And so I spent a lot of time helping people with uh, the way they were communicating their own business priorities and the product market feed and the website stuff. That was a really useful uh, way to get behind the curtain in a lot of businesses. Uh, mm-hmm. once, I'd, once I'd done that, I found myself being much more involved in actual businesses and much less involved in, in the marketing of those businesses. So Again, it was just another lens for me. I, I looked at the way people were communicating about things and I looked about the capability uh, that people had with the execution. Those, those things were happening nicely. That was, it was a good, uh, good, honest way to earn a living, Mark. And then I found myself in a room once where I saw a lot of people who were in the marketing space that were speaking to all sorts of uh, tricks and tools they were using to onboard people. And I thought to myself, I don't think I like where this space is going. And Partially because I didn't like I didn't like the privacy implications of what people were were doing, and I, and I didn't like these data sets which were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and in theory could triangulate me within an inch of my life and be able to determine whether or not I wanted to buy a pair of shoes before I even knew that I wanted to buy a pair of shoes. So wow. I found myself then coincidentally um, uh, across the topic that was Bitcoin and sort of the okay. origin story of that and. And I, and I very quickly identified that this was technology had lots of particular use cases. One of them was privacy enabling. Mm. And then I went down that rabbit hole and we flash forward uh, five or six years and I find myself immersed in a sea of conversations I could not have ever managed, imagined myself being part of. You know, regulatory conversations, tech conversations, payments, finances, uh, macro, micro. So I, I find myself now ensconced in, in this space. It's it's been amazing the journey, and I can't believe it's only been five or six years uh, for you. Because for me, it's only been a year, and the same kind of thing. The the amount of conversations that we're having, the type and quality of conversations that we I could not have had that coming from the fintech and capital markets space so rapidly and so quickly. You know, we are really fast running 
um, innovation here. But what are some of the things that you're up to now? Like um, people may know you um, from Blockchain Australia. Now you're doing Blockchain uh, APAC and you've got some events coming up that we'll talk about. But what what is that? And what are some of the other things that you're up to in terms of advising? I think the reason you and I have gotten along since we first met, Mark, is fundamentally it's just community. I mean, it's yep. all it's all been community building. It continues to be community building. Before I was at Blockchain Australia, I built out a community simply because I chatted to a lot of people mm. and I was able to connect some dots and, and some good relationships were built out of it. That's how I came uh, to be on the radar for Blockchain Australia. They said, we like what you're doing outside of the organisation. Why don't you come to, it, to the organisation and do the same wow. thing? So... In, in leaving the organisation after uh, what I think was a pretty good couple of years, mm-hmm. handing that back and saying to, to someone else, it's now, it's now your role to, to grow this out, I've gone back to doing what I always was doing, which is just different community building and different prioritisation. So all the things that I do tend to be led by what I believe to be the important topics in the space at this point in time. And uh, the reason I've gravitated towards the things I have in the last six to 12 months is there are certain topics which are very difficult to monetize. There are certain topics mm-hmm. which are very difficult to speak to um, in, a, in a consistent fashion and deliver outcomes. They're important. And if you have a lot of stakeholders, it's very difficult to accommodate those stakeholders and have an impact in the, uh, the areas that I think are important. So I focus on that. And so my, my roles now largely allow me to talk about the things I think are important. And I'm uh-huh. finding a lot of people are gravitating towards those conversations once, once I've found myself in the rooms that I think are important, people will often follow me in and I'm able to swing the doors open and allow people in um, often once uh, once the conversations mature. That's brilliant. And, uh, you know, those those conversations have been, you know, evolving over these past, like, you know, when I first got started, it was all, okay, DeFi summers just like hit and stuff. And now there's all these DeFi protocols. There's all this innovation coming out of Australia. Then boom, we were hit with things like Three Arrows Capital and, Celsius, et cetera, and the conversation shifted. Um, but how important is it for you to, you know, just be aware of uh, what's going on and how how does, uh, I guess it's like a, is it a bit of a flywheel? I'm guessing it is because it is for me, but uh, how does the community help the conversations and how does that go back into the community? What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's like the Bitcoin equivalent of the mempool, use some language from, from the protocol itself. All these transactions, all these people are, are accumulating and want to sort of make it through. And the challenge, of course, is uh, the longer this space develops, the more people show up who want to be part of this conversation, Mark. And so it's that filtering which is problematic. I, I think I speak to as many people as I possibly can, and it's still a fraction of the number of people who who I would happily give my time to. You just can't. You just can't find yourself in enough rooms often often enough. The conversation, the maturing of the conversation is material. And, mm. and one of the things that I was saying in 2017, I used to have a slide where I talked about change managers. And the joke was, if you look carefully, it said, don't change managers. There were people in rooms that just are happy with the status quo. And that's yeah. the vast majority of people. So that's, yep. that was issue number one. You find yourself in rooms where largely most people don't want to have a conversation about things that are different because they're busy enough doing things that are the same. And the other thing that was obvious to me back in 2018 was the what I described at the time as the creeping fog of regulation. And mm. it was slow and lots of people who were looking to build out use cases didn't think regulation would be what it was. It was obvious to me that the implications of this technology um, are such that Regulators were always going to get involved, and here they are. You know, it's 2023, and most of the conversation I have has some degree of discussion with respect to what it means from a regulatory perspective, and can you even build the thing you want to build in jurisdictions yeah. like Australia? Yeah, it's it's really interesting that a lot of people um, initially in this space when we got involved uh, were questioning, like, could we actually have regulation work globally because DeFi is global how could you ever regulate DeFi? and um you know right now while we are kind of focusing on CFI, i think it's really good that we're seeing this kind of thing happen because it gives legitimacy you you raise a very valid point there that um the mainstream that how are they going to really come in if we don't have regulation is what it kind of comes down to as much as we want to work in this wild west and push fintech and um sorry finance and uh, gaming nfts etc and music type things on blockchain forward um what are your thoughts on like regulation and uh what's that conversation kind of evolved 
into uh, to where we are kind of now, because we're at the cusp of seeing something happen with regulation here in Australia. At least there's a lot of conversations. But yeah, what are your general thoughts on that? At, at a macro level, Mark, the, the thing that I've been trying to point out to people is <clears throat> we're probably, <clears throat> excuse me, we're, we're not paying enough attention to the fact that globally there's a coordination happening with respect to regulation. Mm. Probably, probably, and this is not to overstate it, the likes of which we've never seen. Very simply put, the technology itself that you and I spend a lot of time uh, giving consideration to is borderless, largely. It's the reason why people in the DeFi space say, well, you can't regulate us because it's borderless. It's the same reason why globally the conversation is, how do we regulate what is ultimately a borderless technology? And it's happening at pace. I've come to realise there are many acronyms in the world that I really didn't know a few years back. The BIS, the Bank of International Settlements, the yep. Financial Action Task Force, uh, the Financial Stability Board, IOSCO, the IMF, all of these organisations, as we speak, are planning regulatory guidance, frameworks and suggestions as to how this industry should be regulated, constrained and supported. All of that is a torrent of regulatory information which is coming just in that cohort that I just described mm. in the next, uh, three to six months. So, so much is happening at the same time as we, largely in Australia now, are twiddling our thumbs, talking about only very small sectors and very small segments of this space. That people are not seeing how much is coming and it's informing, I think, ultimately what kind of economic opportunities will or won't be taken by those in Australia. I think it's really interesting as well, you know, for people that um, I, I think many before uh, getting into this space, um, you know, whether it was like consulting or capital market stuff, yeah, you have lawyers and stuff there and there's a lot of regulatory stuff already established and involved, but you don't see it as much as here because the space is evolving. There's so many lawyers that come to these events because it is a space that they are very much needed. But you mentioned um, the mainstream thing there. I kind of have this belief that with any kind of change, there is the the mainstream, the fat in the middle of the bell curve, and it's the outliers, like either the ones that have made a lot of money and are looking for the next opportunity, or the ones that have been not banked, um, whether they've been debanked or already unbanked or just in unfortunate situations, such as in third world countries, etc. Um, but with those areas at the tails really accepting and trying to bring something into this space and the early adopters, like what happens with the mainstream? How do we get more of those guys on board? Have you seen that kind of conversation evolve over the five, six years that you've been in the space? Yeah, it's funny. People expect and wait for 50.1% of, of uh, <laughs> the community to be on board. It, it doesn't need to happen, Mark. That's yeah. that's kind of the point lost on most people. Edge cases become use cases. That, that mm. don't need to ever become the majority view. You think about most of the things that we engage with in a day-to-day sense, we all do very different things. We all transact very differently. We all have very different habits. It's not this monolithic view of the way technology sort of plays out. Some things you use and some things you don't. The same people mm. that say, I'd never jump on TikTok are yep. the same people that said I was never going to jump on Facebook. And before that, I was never going to jump on whatever. Yeah, the reality is people eventually come around. You don't need that momentum at the 50 percentile before things happen. Things happen at 1 or 2 or 3 or 5 percent. And so what I'm watching is a lot of people who have a need or a desire, one of the two, mm. and play systems better. And so they're finding themselves in rooms that other people share that kind of aim and goal. So I'm watching these, these ecosystems propagate very, very quickly. I think it's interesting that, uh, you know, we, we often see the community get questions like, when is the majority coming in, whether it's the 50.1 or when, it, when are we going to see 80% of people owning NFTs? But they don't have to. You don't have to have um, that much, I guess, kind of market share for something to be successful. You could have a fraction of a less than 0. 0.00 whatever of percent in your cafe slash restaurant having NFTs as memberships and you could be successful there. It doesn't have to be the, you know, we get um, kind of like really narrow in terms of focus that it's only going to be successful when it's like this. But it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be, as you point out. And I wonder, um, you know, we, we talk about or, or we see things where blockchain isn't really being used. It's not NFTs as the wording, whether it's Reddit or it's Starbucks and even others. They're just building on blockchain tech, but they're not really pushing that message down, um, you know, in, into the ideas of people. Uh, what do you think about that? Do you think that we need to have a think about changing 
the wording? Do we just need to build things that people will use? Or is it a marketing kind of thing? Is it a mix of like utility? What, what, what is it that's going to get people using blockchain tech with or without them knowing? I like this question, Mark, because the reality is my answer is generally blunt. That there is no room where people will make a decision that this is what we're going to call this thing and we all move forward. The reality is who cares what you call it? Yep. That, that's, that's my reality right now. When we talk about, um, and I saw this recently on Twitter, someone was chatting about NFTs and they said, we shouldn't call them NFTs. I said, well, what do you want to call them? Digital collectibles. I said, well, a digital collectible might be different to an NFT. It's like, yeah. oh, you're right. So we can go down a rabbit hole that says, what should we do? But the reality is no one's coming together to change it. It's kind of let it be its thing. Just focus on the elements that matter. The other bit is related to sort of the previous point as well. And I've said this a few times lately, the notion that a rising tide lifts all boats. And mm. it's something which is a beautiful um, idea. But the reality is most people don't have boats, Mark. So the, the, <laughs> there is no rising tide that's relevant to you. You need to have a boat. You need to be in the water. You need to be ready for this thing to happen. Yep. All these things need to be in place. And what we do instead, largely, and we'll see uh, this play out again more obviously in a space like the AI space in the next six to 12 months, mm. largely form a view about what they think about AI, having spent a few hours... This is most people will spend a few hours investigating and then they will have very firm views that are going to be almost impossible to dislocate. That's what people do. They read a headline, they form a view, and then they go into reinforcement loops, which give them confidence that theirs is a well thought out view. Great. If that's the way you want to investigate things, go ahead and do it. But I've watched it play out in, in the crypto space, in the blockchain space, in the digital asset space. I'm watching it now in AI. It'll continue to play out in all other sectors. Most people read the the headlines form of you. Happy place to be. But the reality is there's a reason why others spend a lifetime investigating things and still have difficulty getting across all the detail. I think we overestimate um, our own abilities and underestimate the capability of others often when it comes to emerging technology. I agree. I like that rising tide uh, analogy. It ties into so many things, whether it's investing and people thinking they're the smartest folks in the room because, hey, I made a crap load of money on this. I mean, making money when everything like interest rates low and uh, everything else is kind of rising, that's, it's good timing, but it's more down to luck rather than being able to keep it. But, you know, the without boats thing, people uh, in this space are learning and getting educated into how to get involved and realizing just how, not just from the investment point of view, but even how you get involved from a marketing point of view or operations. Like I don't have an experience with Web3. How do I get involved? And having communities that are really thriving across Australia um, that are, are helping on board people, that is really interesting. Um, it leads to something that I'm really curious about your thoughts on with regards to uh, collaborations and having conversations. I mean, I think you are the king uh, of conversations in this space in Australia, and you know, you've you've had so many at different uh, levels. How important is it that to to you anyway, like that you have conversation with so many different uh, people? Like, what what has that helped you with, and what are your thoughts on collaboration and conversation? Well, very much like the space itself, Mark. Uh, incentives matter. I, mean, mm -hmm. I chat to a lot of people to understand what their incentives are, and. You know, on an average on an average day, as is the case for most people who have some degree of a profile, you get a lot of you get a lot of people inboxing you. And usually, what they're doing is they inbox you with their perspective of the world and their need and their desire, which is not anything I begrudge. But they're cold messages that involve their priorities, their incentives. Mm. The problem with that is, you know, how do you get qualitative information? All people are telling you is here's what I want and here's what I need. So, so mine is in reverse. You know, I go into those conversations trying to get a sense of what those incentives mean in other rooms, as opposed to saying, what mm. can you give me? It's like, what value do you have? I was chatting to someone today about this, this event that I'm planning. Mm -hmm. and, and when I was chatting to them about what the pros, I said to them, what value do you leave in the room? And it was a very difficult question for them to answer because they came in from a lens that was, we need brand recognition and we have a marketing budget. And I said, but what's the value? The value is not the brand recognition. And the value yeah. is, that's, that is a, an incentive that they have internally, but there's no value to be distributed in the room so they're they're the reasons i chat to people and where possible this is one of the flywheels that you mentioned before mark i've spoken to so many people like thousands literally thousands and thousands of people so when i had a conversation today with a very large organization ultimately what i said to them was i can save you a lot of time because all they need to do is give me the wish list of the people and i'll be able to discern for them who they should shouldn't talk to largely i said with exceptions but the reality is i can save them a lot of time and i think that's the that's the 
upside to spending a lot of time with people is ultimately mm. you're able to save a lot of time. I think it's really cool. You know, we we mentioned um, like collaboration conversation there. It really leads to smarter connections and it's smarter because as you said, it's saving time. And um, as someone that's kind of been doing this before getting into the Web3 space by, you know, being involved in not-for-profits, uh, little do people know that I'm involved in a data science uh, not-for-profit and now it's started to become popular because of all the chat GPT and AI stuff you know, hackathons and all that kind of fun stuff. And I still do a lot of data things, but it's more on the crypto side now. But, um, you know, leading from, you know, the the collaboration conversation and, and having those smarter uh, types of connections is just really interesting because I think people like you and me, we would have just done it anyway. It, it, even if Web3 wasn't there, it's just fascinating that Web3 is a place that puts that on a really much higher pedestal because I don't think, would you say this is true? Do you, I don't think that you get anywhere without building community in this space. I think it's a lot harder for you to do things. Like I would write, I'm not saying that no to marketing or whatever, but instead of just doing marketing for ourselves, I think by marketing and helping lift the boats up all together, it's been better off. What, what do you kind of think about that sort of philosophy? Yeah, I think you get found out if you take shortcuts, Mark. Mm. Particularly in a space where, people's reputations are at risk. And that's the nature of this space. The thing about people getting this wrong, if you back the wrong horse here, then you find yourself in a position where you, you, you get attached to that decision. And so I'm mindful of other people's reputations. So yeah. it makes it even more sort of precipitous here. You know, if you make bad decisions or a series of bad decisions, it's easy to basically become irrelevant because people say this is not someone that's able to determine or exercise good judgment when it comes to the relationship. This is a... a, a think something I've said to you from the very beginning, Mark, one thing that I identified about what you were doing and what the team is doing at Oz DeFi is you're showing up. It's, it's very hard to yeah. question people's bona fides if you show up all the time and over an extended period of time, because it means uh, you're either a fool because you've done it forever or you're genuine. And you go, the reality is over time, people start to realise and when you've shown up for little money or no money mm. uh, over a period of months and years, people say, well, they're here for a reason. And it's very, this is sort of the corollary to me. It's an interesting thing for me. You, know, you can push back more. I push back more in the sense that I say to people, I've spent a lot of time and continue to um, helping people that will never, ever provide me any commercial outcome because I would like to do that. So when others come at me, it's easy for me to say, I'm helping a lot of people and to push back. It makes, it makes conversations more efficient because I find how people deal with rejection, myself included, is a very good sign of how valuable they'll be in the rooms uh, that they want to be in. Because if you get a no and the no leads you to respond in a, in a very aggressive way or a selfish way, yeah. then they're not people that should be in the rooms anyway. So it's, it's always an interesting thing to see that play out. I see it uh, being tested um, in various ways by different people in the community, just testing what the responses are if they try you know, to respond in a certain way, just to see what those reactions are. Because... You know, I think we really get a lot of different types of folks in the community and some are here for, you know, very much uh, collaborative type uh, reasons, whereas others are just here to extract value and uh, run off, you know, whether it's an NFT sale that, you know, has a quick mint founders run off with the quick bucks or those that were on the whitelist. It, it doesn't really help um, the space at all. And hopefully, you know, we're cracking down on that kind of stuff a bit more. But do you think that we've got two types of folks, you know, those that extract value and then those that are selfless, like the selfish versus the selfless. What do you think about that? It's a tricky balance, Mark. I mean, the reality is we're all driven by some degree of self-interest here. I mean, if yeah. all you're doing is always trying to help other people, you'll, you'll go broke, you'll, you know, you'll lose your home, you won't be able to buy sure. There is always that balance. But it's just the way people perceive others' needs versus their own. You know, I used to have a client when I was chatting to them once about, uh, what they wanted and the meetings they were having. And they said they were tired of meeting with people. And I said, why is that? And they said, everybody wants something from me. Mm. And I said, okay, what kind of meetings do you want? And they said, I want to go into a room to be able to have this kind of outcome. I said, aren't you by definition the person that you've just said is a parasite and only wants something from you? <laughs> they didn't take the advice well, Mark, but yeah. they did ultimately take the advice, which was they recognised they started giving more because their lens was if this person is trying to get something from me, they're extractive, but if mm. I want to do that, I'm value accretive. It was the same thing. And and so that realisation was a very tough one, but I think I watched them and they became much better in business because they realised that you can't tar everyone with the same brush. So the reality of those kinds of conversations and context, and you know, I met mm. a regulator 
uh, a number of years ago and I walked into the room and I said to them, I'm going to be in the back of the room because what I'm doing isn't important enough to have me at the front of the room, but it's coming. So what I didn't do is say, put me at the front of the room. What I'm saying is the most important thing. I said, I'll be here. And then I showed up and slowly made my way through those rooms, made it to the stage, made it to the front of the stage, and ultimately was the one curating the conversations. I delivered on what I said, which was, I'm here, and I have an understanding of this space, and it is moving in a direction which I was able to identify for them. So by the time I got to the front of that room, they had confidence that I understood the implications of these things. And, and that's, a, that's a byproduct of time and confidence in your own abilities and the abilities of those around you. I think it's interesting that uh, it takes a bit of time to get to that stage. And if you've got the ability to, I'm not saying everyone necessarily can because we're all at uh, kind of different positions, career-wise, uh, what we're currently kind of doing with our own businesses, et cetera. Those, there's all sorts of different timeframes, but just say that um, people do have that bit of room to, to be a bit more community oriented that haven't been that way before do you have any kind of advice because it is a bit of a mindset shift from say building in stealth to now building in the open for example if you're a builder but even a mindset shift from being competitive to now finding ways to be yeah you compete but you collaborate a bit more as well like how do you think people should think about that kind of mindset shift most of the people i know who are trying to build something mark spend a lot of time building and not enough time communicating what they're trying to build and okay. it's, a, it's a classic failing of earnest and honest people. They just say, I'm busy doing the work. They go, mm. well, unless the work is being seen and identified, unless you're saying to people, here's where I was, here's where I'm going, here's where I'm here. You need to give people a timeline that gives them confidence. There's touch points. Like you think about it from a marketing perspective, you, you talk about how many touch points it takes to actually sell a product. You don't mm. usually just see an ad with no context and press buy. What you do is you see a product or you see a need and you see some comms and something reinforced, and eventually you're in that you're in the funnel in the marketing sense. In that conversation, you go, I view, I view the same thing when I watch people. You go, you've got to give people confidence that you are doing the thing um, that you claim to be doing, and that you will continue to do so into the future. People underestimate that. And one of the challenges of the way they communicate in these things, and this is a social channels exercise, we all think we're seen much more than we are. The internet doesn't really care for almost any of us. Unless you are someone like Donald Trump or Kardashian, the internet doesn't care. So we overestimate how much we're interfering with people's lives. And, and people often say, I don't want to post too often because people get sick of me. And I say, no one's going to see you. It's okay. Post as much as you like. The reality is if you're not interesting enough, and even if you are, these algorithms are not made to share your story. There are a couple of billion people that are doing the same thing. So people uh, need to be a little bit more confident in their own abilities and need mm. to be a little bit louder in the way they communicate it. Now, if you start from the opposite end of the spectrum, which is you're all noise and hot air, you're not doing anything, you'll get found out anyway. So I don't worry too much about the people who market first and do very little else. Um, the passage of time is usually the great, uh, the great arbiter of whether or not they've got any value to live. I agree. And yeah, it's really interesting what you mentioned there, like no one, don't worry about what people are looking at. It's like at the gym. Um, people worry about, oh, is someone looking at me and stuff like, no, just do your own thing. Most of the time, everyone is just concerned with themselves and what they're doing. Um, but I guess that's that's what makes us human and a, a recognition of that is is going to go a long way. So hopefully people take that uh, on board. It's, it's interesting as well because I've seen presentations where you have a complete opposite of projects, one that is just getting started but gets more interest because people are really interested in coming on board and helping out very early in the journey versus something that is near complete and finished and doesn't get as much interest, even though they've got this really cool product there because they have an involved community from the very start. But uh, yeah, it's a very interesting point there. Um, let's, let's get into something about the community with say outliers in the community and something a bit more, you know, fun and something I've had to deal with uh, more recently because, you know, we, I've never done anything like this before. Like even the data science thing, it's been a group that's been created prior to my time helping direct it and running events there. But, you know, getting into this space, building from scratch, you see the growth, the wave, the high rise, and, you know, you, you have the roller coaster over time where some members just don't agree with what it is that you're doing. So this is something more for the other community builders out there. Like how do you deal with those outliers when, you know, not backlash necessarily, um, not as extreme as that, but I guess I'd say that, you know, you have um, the differing views. How do you kind of handle something like that from your experience? 
So when I took on the role of Blockchain Australia, it's fair to say the organisation didn't have a particularly high profile, Mark. So the circumstances afforded me an opportunity which many people don't have, which is no one cared enough to care. So <laughs> I was able to exercise a lot of decisions over a short period of time and build momentum. And that's one of the things at an early stage, and this is akin to a startup stage, I spoke to a lot of people very deliberately. I was very public about the fact that I was speaking to all these people. I built momentum and momentum and got wins. And then I was able to carry them into rooms. But to your point, what happens is when, you're, when you've gotten to that point and you've got attention, then people do very quickly come at you and say, here is what I think I should be doing and here's how I should be uh, portrayed. That becomes, a, that becomes a resourcing challenge because mm -hmm. when, when I delivered with Blockchain Australia Blockchain Week uh, last year, it would have been a ratio at least of 20 to 1, uh, the number of people who wanted to speak versus those we could accommodate. Even though we had wow. 250 speakers, we had 2,500 people um, uh, who said, who've said to me, quite rightly, they, they were capable of speaking, and, the, and that's true, but they just weren't able to. And mm. so being able to go back and efficiently say, here's the reason why, and if you can do this, here's the reason why I chose this person. Here's the reason why you are a good fit, but you're not a good fit in this instance, or here's the reason why we haven't chosen you. Mm. That, that ends up being something that you can do most of the time, but at certain uh, junctures like uh, the pressure that was towards the end of blockchain week, I couldn't deal with those conversations at the pace I would have liked to without yeah. actually jeopardising the events itself. So you kind of say, what do you do? You can spend all your time explaining to people why they didn't get chosen and invariably, Mark, and I understand it, once you've told people why, they still think they should. So you're not going to convince people. And, yeah. and that's one of the challenges that I have. I think there are all sorts of people who have great merit in contributing, but sometimes you just can't. And, mm. and this is where... I'm I think it was a Seth Godin saying where he said, choose yourself. You need to find environments and opportunities where you can allow yourself to be chosen. So if you don't like the fact that you're not being held up as an expert, well, maybe you should do something a little bit different that makes you more compelling or build your own platform yep. to do it versus turning around and saying, you should recognise what I've done. And one of the conversations again today, someone said to me, we think we can add value into this room. I said, no one knows who you are. So you're mm. already on the eight ball because... Brand does give some value, and if you're not going to be that person, you need to find another compelling reason why you should shortcut the conversation and do it. So it's 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 an imprecise science, mate. And with the benefit of hindsight, we're all geniuses. Um, the reality here is uh, a lot of good people should be heard, um, but I don't think enough people take it upon themselves to do things consistently enough to make sure that they are heard. I think it's interesting as well that... Um whether it's for events like this or say for our meetups and people wanting to speak and stuff, it, it's almost like sales, right? Like you've got to think about where are the people that are your targets in this case, if it was blockchain Australia back then, um, where are they looking at? What, what do they pay attention to? And if you're not in front of them, then why should, or how should, there's only 24 hours in a day. It's super difficult. I think you know, if anything, people should take that kind of feedback uh, positively. And if they want to find out ways, like, I mean, I'd be very happy to help them out, understand what they could be doing to elevate themselves. And hopefully we have more positive conversations like that. But sometimes these things happen and there's just friction and friction alone. And it leads to just like bad blood, but I'd rather the friction leads to something more positive. And it's certainly an opportunity that we've got here. So hopefully we see a lot more of that. I wanted to ask you something as well that I, I think might be interesting for you that, uh, you know, this is like a reverse, you know, card kind of thing, but you, you get asked a lot of questions. You're, you're up on stage, you're in podcasts, et cetera. And certainly you're in a lot of these conversations on as advisory board type member and advisor to various projects. Um, but what are the things, what, what is something that you would like to get asked or what's a question that you'd like to get asked that people just, aren't asking what's the you know the read between the lines thing that you you might see missing um do you have something on that well mark for me again consistent with what we've been chatting about here people don't ask why they can't get this conversation they lament right they're not getting it but they don't understand why they don't understand what the impediments to these conversations are and that means people aren't self-aware in a lot of those uh, environments they find themselves trying to enter because they're coming with a product invariably technologists are a classic mm. technologists are I said I, I I look at them admiringly they can fix problems but what they don't ask is why don't why don't people want this problem fixed they, they identify the problem but they say why don't they want it fixed and then there's a multivariate sort of 
conversation that comes from there. Some people, it might be resourcing, it might be timing, it might be age, experience, it might be all sorts of things. But they said, but I can fix that problem. And, and that's one of the things that people don't do. They don't, they don't turn the mirror back on themselves and say, why is this not playing out the way um, I would like it to play out? Yeah, it's really interesting that uh, that we, we don't think further ahead than just like, what is that next kind of goal? I've got this meeting, I need this next outcome. But I think it kind of involves thinking beyond just that as to like, what what is the you know, we're, we're all part of different systems, right? Like we think that, hey, my idea right now is we get rid of fractional reserve banking. Well, if you did that, you're going to get rid of sure debt creation, but then how do you create credit? How do you have small businesses borrow? How do you not slow down capital markets um, and just make a problem? Like thinking about systems is, is really key there. So I think that if people think about that a bit more, like what are the after effects of, me just asking this question, okay, well, if I'm asking this from Steve or the community, well, they they need to have something that comes out of it as well. So how do I cater for that? And I think systems thinking is really going to help there. But, um, you know, do you, do you where, where do you go for, apart from the conversations, like, do you look anywhere like books or uh, videos? Are there certain podcasts that you like to to kind of watch and stuff? What What, what are you kind of looking at for inspiration and stuff? Yeah, but for me, it's a it's a filtering exercise. Mm -hmm. Mark, I, I try to go as wide as possible, and invariably we find ourselves, you know, into thought bubbles and and going down sort of chambers that you wouldn't otherwise expect. But it's kind of constantly trying to get a sense of am I going wide enough, and then and then filtering mm -hmm. down. The reality of most of the stuff that you would otherwise consume is it has a very firm view, and there are not alternate views expressed on either side. You know, you tend to listen to things that uh, affirm your view. So I'm, I'm super conscious of that. The, the thing I like to do um, over, over a period of time, I think it's what delivers a lot of the value is I, I like the currency of news as in things that are happening in the space, but I like the consistency over a long period of time because the news itself is rarely what it appears to be. But the implication of that or the absence of implication is something you can only determine over a long period of time. So I listen to a lot of things that are happening um, internationally and particularly when people give you their first um, the first uh, iteration of what they believe it to be just doesn't play out. Everything is doom and gloom. Everything's going to ruin everything. It's the worst thing ever. Yeah, really. Yeah. Over an extended period of time, you look back and say, well, hold on, that bit of news was meant to foretell this thing, but it didn't happen. So what did happen? And so then you connect the dots on those news, news sources. And that serves two purposes as well, because it keeps your knowledge current. Mm -hmm. It also allows you to step back and say, over a period of time, am I seeing patterns emerging? And it's one of the reasons I consume a lot of short form things as well is because right. I create my own narratives because I, if I can consume a lot of them rather than saying here is a, here is a well thought out view because I'll give you a, a, a simple example. For those mm. that believe um, there is only one um, a conversation to be had in crypto or Bitcoin, it's, it's, uh, it's, sorry, it, it is Bitcoin. You go, Bitcoin maxis? I love what Bitcoin maxis think, which is there is nothing else. But the mm. reality there is, very difficult to dislodge that conversation. I can continue to live in that world. I like to say, well, what's the spectrum of views here? And do I still think that the maxi approach is a good one because I've given ample consideration to everything else? So it's kind of, I like a framing and then I like to sort of push out from that to get a view uh, of uh, alternate theories and, and then attach my own sort of colour to it. And the good news, and this is one of the challenges which I recognise you face and the team faces that I was uh, DeFi, um, you know you're doing a good job if people think you are all the things that they don't like. You know, you were, I was joking about it on Twitter yesterday with one of your colleagues. Yep. You know, are you a government sympathiser? You're definitely against privacy in, or you're, you're a libertarian that wants the world to go to, uh, uh, to, go to shit. You go, the yep. reality here is which one? If they think you're both, you're probably doing a good job in communicating. <laughs> It's it's ironic, right? Like that that never let them know your next move. Like people will paint you with a black brush, not a white brush, or vice versa, or whatever it is. When it turns out you're really potentially grey in the middle, I, I like to think of it more as like just being pragmatic, like not not necessarily. And there's different people out there like this where they they see they want to see the best of both sides. Like sure, the the pros and cons of this side versus the pros and cons of this side and whether it's like going from web two to web three, but being pragmatic and just finding the best um, solution that mixes both. And sure, we're always going to have, and I think it's valuable to have those people that are the maxis on um, either side, but it's, 
it just becomes very hard when you're so uh, maximalist that you don't see the parts where it doesn't work, where your system doesn't work. Like if if everything was on Bitcoin, well, credit creation is a bit harder now because we've got a limited hard money supply that doesn't really lend itself to um, a, a fast ability to imagine the world at a much more slower pace in terms of being able to build and uh, create new industries and fund things. It's something that, uh, you know, is not really thought about. So I think it's re- like to, to your point, like it's really important that people kind of recognize like both sides there and find a view that kind of fits and just it, it comes from being open, right? Being open to actually having that kind of thing. So let, let's lead into something else there, like the future, like, you know, we saw NFTs, the rise of that, more brands getting on board. And um, we saw the fall of FTX and other things like, uh, you know, the, the retail rise and fall. And now we're starting to see corporates come into this space. But where do you kind of see the future to be with, um, with you know, whether we call it Web3 or not in the future, because we stopped calling it Web 2.0 not long after Facebook and Instagram and all that came out. So maybe that's where we head. But just where do you see the world moving in terms of adoption of um, this really cool kind of blockchain and crypto tech? I think I'm a great futurist, Mark, because I don't look that far into the future. The reality yeah. here is <laughs> most people who offer views on on sort of multi-horizon yeah. uh, uh, sort of outcomes are wrong. We're terrible predictors of the of you know material sort of distance into the future. What I see happening here is I see narratives building and, and I see momentum building. Now, again, what, what might come out of it might, might not be what people expect and things might come out of sort of thin air. Mm-hmm. But the reality of kind of regulatory conversations is they're moving towards narratives around the tokenization of real world assets. Now, that might spawn something entirely different, but the reality is that's where the conversation is going. People are mm-hmm. starting to say, not in a dissimilar way, uh, to they were saying in 2017 and 18, but the tech wasn't quite as ready. Mm. The tech now is much more ready. So what happens now? Is there an opportunity to fractionalize and tokenize real world assets? Where the momentum is going is where likely the opportunities will will go. Conversations uh, that are sort of intersecting that kind of uh, that kind of view are things when we're talking about ESG, we're talking about carbon markets, or carbon credits, the trading of these things. They're new markets, so mm. you, can, you can assume that people will move towards new economic opportunities as they're formed. So they're the kinds of conversations that are playing out um, in in a medium term uh, time horizon. And I think there's enough momentum behind them now, and there's and there's enough technology capability behind it now that it's a much more meaningful conversation this time around. So that, that's that's what I'm saying. Now, the other thing, which is uh, probably not music to the ears of most people in the space, is a lot of economic opportunity will come from the picks and shovels that are onboarding things related to KYC and AML and track and trace businesses, custody businesses, their infrastructure businesses. So again, there, there really are uh, lots of use cases that are building there. I spoke to someone before that was talking about payments, and I said mm. the most obvious use case in payments is the thing that onboards people into payments because it makes payments safer. So they're uh, the environments I expect a lot of startups will build and grow very, very quickly in because they're they're connecting the pipes much more than saying, here is the pipe that you were that you need. I think that's really key. And you know, finding it, it goes back to finding ways that make it easier for people to get on board or for businesses to utilize these tools that like we see how things can be more efficient and um, what transparency does and what quicker value transfer. But unless you're making it easier for people to use these things, it's going to be such a hard uh, future to get to. So, and very interesting, as you mentioned there, what are the conversations that are going on right now? Um, And if those are the conversations around real world assets and tokenization, well, that's certainly something for people to think about. But just as we wrap up, you know, the, the question that we like to ask all our guests um, like a one or two liner. And I know we've spoken about community a lot more in this episode than I have with others, but what in one or two lines does community mean for you, Steve Ellis? It's the most selfish thing I do, Mark. The reality here is I feel good about myself mm. if, I can, if I can help someone else. And I, it's not an original thought. Uh, I think it was uh, Ruslan Kogan from uh, mm. the Kogan website. I remember him saying, charity is the most selfish thing he does because he says, look at me giving this away it doesn't make me feel good about myself I, I i'm i'm incentivized by that so the community for me is i like watching people um be elevated uh with respect to the station in life that they thought and saw themselves having i, I like helping people 
who say, this is what I think I can be, get past that. Because then you sort of, a little back to the future style, you go, you get to write your own future when you get past the point that you thought you would never get past. So for me, community is trying to get people enough momentum mm. get to a point that they didn't think they'd get to. And then after that, it's kind of like, now it's on you. So that, that's kind of the way I view community and community building. That's beautiful. And, um, you know, we certainly feel that too. And we're only just starting on our journey, but we certainly feel that really positive kind of um, that that energy that happens when you see someone that you've helped out a little bit just rise beyond where they were and they're starting to kick goals and stuff as well. So, and I'm certain you're going to do that. You helped us. We're helping others. Hopefully we just see more of this kind of stuff spread across all the conversations that we've got. But speaking of conversation, if people, you know, want to get in touch with you, they, they, you know, they might've just met you here for the first time on this podcast. I'm sure they haven't, but just in case they have, how do people uh, best reach out to you? Our conversation's easiest on Twitter still for, for as many criticisms as people have of that platform, it's easiest to direct <laughs> channel in. So I'm at Steve Ballas there. If they're not connected with me on LinkedIn, I post periodic on LinkedIn. Obviously, yep. DMs and LinkedIn are inefficient. So Steve Ballas on, on LinkedIn, those two channels are the most obvious ones. Well, Twitter there, as long as we still have it for now and it's not going through changed logos and uh, maybe another changed ownership type thing, but at least it is where the conversation is at now and LinkedIn folks. So make sure to check that out. Steve, Thank you so, so much for your time. Uh, and we'll see you soon in person at a conference uh, or even online. Thanks, Mark.